Hello, class, and welcome to this virtual lecture on motivation. Without further ado, I will go ahead and get started by sharing my screen and get my lecture up here. Uh, okay. And hopefully you can see all that. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about Chapter 10, Motivation and Emotion. First, I'll talk about motivation. I'm going to talk about some theories of motivation. Then I'm going to talk about two specific motivations, hunger and eating. Well, really, that's the same one. And then the uh, another specific motivation, sexual behavior. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about emotion toward the end of this chapter. This uh, lecture will be broken up into two different videos. So first off, what is motivation? What does that mean? When we're motivated to do something, we are kind of compelled to do it. We have a want or a need that leads us in that direction. You may be motivated, for example, to check your uh, Snapchat or social media or email or whatever. It, it, it directs us toward a goal and it feels like a want or a need in that direction. So motivations can come from a, a couple of different places. One, they can come from within you, and another, they can come from outside of you. From inside, we see motivation as intrinsic, in meaning inside, right? So sometimes we're motivated out of curiosity, out of interest. You may be motivated to do well in school, for example, because you're actually really enjoying learning, Right. But then there's also extrinsic. And that's why uh, that's when you're motivated for something outside. So, for example, you may be motivated um, to please your parents. And that's why you're doing well in school. You're working in school to please your parents. You see how that's outside rather than inside. So we call that extrinsic from the word external outside. OK. We're going to talk about um, a couple different theories of motivation, three of them in particular. So the first one is drive theory. And drive theory says that basically what we want is to be chill. We do not want to be too hungry, for example, or too full. We want to be right in the middle. We don't want to be too hot or too cold. We want to be right in the middle. We don't want to be too freaked out and stressed out, but we also don't wanna to be too bored. We wanna be right in the middle. And so what the drive theory says is that when we get out on a limb, we get too hungry, that's gonna motivate us to get back to the middle. If we get too full, that also motivate us to get back to the middle. And so uh, what we're doing is we're finding this middle or this what we call homeostasis. And motivation comes when things get too high or too low. And um, there's a, a, another issue is the level of arousal because um, level of arousal is sort of how stressed you are. And there's a, a, a law called the yerkes dotson law, and you can see it here in, the, in this picture. Um, we do best when we're a little bit stressed, not too, not too stressed. That will mess up your performance. For example, if you're a little bit stressed for a test, that will tend to make you study. So that's actually good for your performance. But if you're too stressed, then that can mess up your performance because it's hard to think when you're too stressed. So there's an optimal arousal level and, and, and that is our homeostatic arousal level. Okay, uh, next theory of motivation, motivation theory number two is self-efficacy theory. Efficacy coming from the word effective is believing that you yourself are effective, believing that you can do it. And th uh, this is a big factor for motivation, whether or not you believe you can do it. Because if you think that you can't do math, for example, you won't even try. So believing that you can do it affects your motivation in the sense that then you will tend to move toward it. So if we can get people to believe that they can do math, they're more likely to do well in a math class because they're more likely to try basically in practice. Finally, the last theory of motivation is called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And as you can see in this picture, these are different needs that are on different levels of a pyramid. 
And the idea behind here is that we, uh, we, we are motivated toward these things, but we only become motivated toward the next level after we satisfy the first level. So the very first level is air, water, food, shelter. You know, these are the most basic things. Like if you don't have this stuff, you don't give two craps about anything else at this point. All you think about, if you don't have enough food, all you think about is food. That's it. You don't really care about anything else. But once you've got all that food and water and shelter stuff taken care of, then you start to be concerned about safety and security. If you have all that taken care of, well, then you start to be concerned about your sense of love and belongingness. And then you start being motivated to find friends and stuff. But if you don't have any air, you're not thinking about finding friends. You know what I mean? I mean, that you have to fulfill the bottom before you fulfill the top. And that self-esteem motivation is building uh, one's own accomplishments. So your ability to do well in school and get good grades and everything is, is uh, dependent on having your physiological needs met, having safety and security, and having a sense of love and belongingness. So Maslow would have said, you're not going to be motivated in school unless you got all that taken care of. Okay, well, I want to move on now. Those were our three theories of three theories of motivation. And, um, and I want to move on to talk a little bit about hunger and eating at this point. Okay, so one big issue with hunger and eating is what makes us motivated to start eating or to stop eating. And there are a number of what we call physiological cues or cues having to do with the body, what our bodies are telling us that makes us eat. For example, um, having your stomach empty. We start to get a, a, some hormonal action in the stomach when it gets empty and then it kind of growls and stuff and that will get us wanting to eat. Also, your blood sugar going low. So whatever you eat is transformed into sugar in your blood or glucose in your blood, which powers all your cells and everything like that. If you haven't eaten in a long time, sometimes your glucose can go low and then that will make us hungry. Satiation is a, another word for feeling full. So this is a question of what makes us feel full. There are some hormones that make us feel full. One of them is called leptin. And it is a hormone that comes from fat cells. So if you have a lot of fat cells, you will tend to feel fuller. And so that's your body's way of kind of pulling back. Another thing that makes you feel full is your, um, the stretching of your stomach. So when your stomach actually physically gets stretched, then that makes you feel full. And all of these signals, blood sugar, hormonal signals, stomach stretching, all of that feeds back to the hypothalamus. Remember the four Fs, one of those Fs is feeding. And so the hypothalamus is gonna handle all those signals. But there's a lot of environmental cues too. For example, the size of the plate. If we have bigger plates, we tend to eat more. If we have all you can eat or a lot of varieties of food, we tend to eat more. So there are lots of things that make us eat. Time of day can make you eat and things like that. So there's a lot, apart from what's going on in your body, there's a lot of other things going on. Social situations make you want to eat even if you're not hungry. So you've probably seen this before. This is uh, called BMI or body mass index. And you can pause here and kind of see where you're at by looking at your height and looking at your weight to try to see where you are health-wise in terms of body size. But I wanna to turn to um, issues of obesity and why it's so hard for people to lose weight. So we have a lot of problems losing weight. Losing weight is actually one of the most difficult things to do, not in the short term, because that's pretty easy, but losing weight in the long term is very difficult. And I wanna explain why that is. One thing is that we have this concept called metabolic rate. That is what we call our metabolism, right? So if I have a fast metabolism, that means I burn calories really easily. I can eat a lot and I won't gain weight. If you have a slow metabolism, then you tend to gain weight more easily. Well, what happens 
is that our metabolism can vary according to where our body wants to be. And that's what we call a set point. So most of my life, I have weighed the same amount since I was uh, maybe 18 or so years old. I was about right around 125, 130 pounds. I have been there almost my entire life. Doesn't mean I haven't eaten a lot at times. I eat a lot at times. I will go and eat a huge amount, for example, at once. And then um, at other times I eat less. But what happens to me and what happens to everybody is that when you eat a lot, your metabolism will tend to speed up to bring you back down to that set point. My set point is about 125. If I start to lose weight, my, my metabolism will slow down and bring me back to 125. So I will tend to stay at that weight. Um, and so that's kind of a problem because <coughs> let's say you want to lose weight. If you, start to, if you start to go down in weight, your metabolism goes down and tries to bring you back to that original weight. So Exercise increases metabolism and exercise is effective for weight loss, just hard for people to keep it up. Um, the gastric bypass or band surgery tends to be the most effective way to, um, to reduce obesity in the sense that what it does is it restricts the size of the stomach so that the stomach stretches out and tells the hypothalamus, ah, oh, that's enough food, um, but it requires surgery. And of course, with surgery, there's expense and there's pain and there's all kinds of possible complications. So it's really tough to lose weight. And so people get into this dieting cycle where what they do is they start to diet and then they get this kind of famine response they start to lose weight, but their metabolic rate goes down. And so then their body holds on to calories more, it won't burn calories as easily. They start to store fat because their body is going, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're losing, let's get back to that set point. And then what happens is then they fall off of the diet and they will tend to binge at that point because if you've been starving, now you want to binge. And so you eat a whole bunch, but your metabolic rate is still really slow. And so you tend to gain very easily. And so what happens a lot of times with dieting is it actually makes you gain weight rather than lose weight. So dieting is a tough thing. Well, if you want to lose weight, there is a small set of dieters who tend who who have lost weight in the long term, meaning over five years or ten years, they keep the weight off. Most people will gain it back within a year. Most, I mean, ninety some percent of dieters gain the weight back in a short period of time. But here are some things you can do if you want to lose weight. Recognize that eating and exercise changes have to be permanent. So people go on this low carb diet or no carb diet, eventually they go off of it and then they gain the weight back. It's not it's sustainable over the long term. You know, or maybe you can, I mean, if you eat only grapefruit, you're gonna lose weight. Yeah, but eventually you're gonna have to eat something else. You know what I mean? And so you gotta find something that's sustainable. Same thing with exercise. You say, well, I'm gonna start going to the gym. Guess what? To keep the weight off, you got to keep going and keep going for life, for the long term. Minimize your exposure to temptation. We know that what happens with uh, if you have a, a thing of chips out on the counter, that will make you eat, even if your body is not particularly hungry. Just seeing it makes you eat. So put away those chips. Don't buy the chips. Hide everything so that it's not immediately accessible. Exercise regularly and get enough sleep. That will bring up your metabolism um, and help you to better regulate your blood glucose. Eating healthy, um, you know, whole grains, fruits, and vegetables because those tend to be less, uh, they tend to be metabolized slow, slowly and also um, have fewer calories. Don't get too hungry because getting too hungry means you'll binge. And if you mess up, don't give up on the whole plan. Just come right on back to it. Okay, well, let's talk about a few of the effects of obesity. 
there are some physical effects of obesity and then there are social effects of obesity. I'll let you review those physical effects. You probably already know the, the uh, problems associated with obesity in terms of our physical health. But there are also social consequences to obesity. For example, there are stereotypes that obese people are lazy or unmotivated. And because of those stereotypes, we see discrimination on, on jobs that um, obese people are less likely to get called back, for example, for an interview, um, wage discrimination, obese people tend to make less money, romantic relationships, people who are obese tend to have fewer and uh, uh, shorter romantic relationships is what we find in the literature. So there, it, uh, so there are a lot of social consequences to obesity. And that's something where, that we have to grapple with as a society because we have this premium on the idea of thinness. And, and, and these kinds of stereotypes are akin to gender stereotypes or race stereotypes. And so it's something to really think about within ourselves. Okay, well, we're gonna go on to sexual behavior in the next video. You guys have a fantastic day. And thank you for listening.